Okay, chapter 27, ATI, mycobacterial, fungal, and parasitic infections is what we're going to talk about. And there are three different organisms here. So there are four drugs, but there are three different organisms, and they, and they all kind of work a little bit differently, have different diseases associated with them, so we kind of need to talk about that. So let us start with tuberculosis. It's caused by a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that's a good name for a disease or for a bacterium that causes tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis is up to 32% of the world's population may be infected. It's not as common in uh, the United States, but it is common worldwide. It's the most common worldwide. Body's immune response attempts to wall off that pathogen. So it kind of kind of isolates it, isolates it, walls it off. It has a hard time killing it, and we'll look at why that's the case. So after it's walled off, it can stay dormant for uh, in these things called tubercles for for years. Okay, so usually it remains dormant, but a decreased immune system can cause it or can give it the opportunity to become active. So, like something like AIDS, so something that's immunocompromising, can cause it to become active again. And that's going to be kind of important for when we talk about like multi drug therapies and stuff like that later in a minute. So mycobacterium, what's the difference? So what's the difference between mycobacterium and the other bacteria that we've been talking about? So if we look at a gram negative, so we can see the gram negative, we have the peptidoglycan layer, we have the cell wall. Okay, so this whole thing is the cell wall, uh, but we were looking earlier at this peptidoglycan layer and how it's really thin in um, gram negative and it's thicker in gram positive, and that's really what we focused on. There are also, you know, two membranes associated with gram negative. And then if we go over here and we look at mycobacteria, the thing is they have this special layer, okay, it's in red, that's good, that consists of mycolic acids, okay, mycolic acid. Now mycolic acid is a waxy, we just all we have to do is think of it as a waxy coating, okay, so it's a waxy coating to the point that there are porins that have to, you know, be there to kind of allow things to move through. So it doesn't like to take stuff up. It doesn't. Uh, you couldn't. You couldn't even gram stain it because the gram stain would wouldn't penetrate it because it has this waxy coating on it. Well, that also kind of protects it from a lot of antibiotics. And so there are special antibiotics that are needed, or special combinations of antibiotics that are needed, which is why we care. Um, one of the drugs that we're going to talk about, isozyanid, inhibits the production of that mycolic acid coating. So now we have a special drug that is is specific for the mycobacteria family. Okay, So uh, let's talk about multidrug therapy. Normally, I think we've talked about the fact that we don't normally like to use multiple drugs. We don't like to use multiple bacteria because that can cause an increased risk of resistance. Um, but in, in the case of tuberculosis, it's, it's, it is recommended, and also HIV that we're going to talk about later. So multidrug therapy is kind of a new thing now. So in, not new thing in the world, but new thing in our class. So in typical infections, multidrug therapy, multidrug therapy is not desired because it's affected by antagonism. So that's another thing. Combining two drugs may decrease the efficacy, efficacy, efficacy of each one. So, and then also it may increase the risk of resistance. So multidrug therapy can be used when, if there were a case where multiple organisms cause infection, and the one we care about for treatment of tuberculosis, and the one that we're going to care about later, treatment of HIV. So for TB, different combinations are typically used during the course of therapy necessary because mycobacterium grows slowly. It's commonly resistant, so multiple drugs can weaken a range of resistant targets, and you kind of just keep, keep, going, keep going with it. Uh, so ther therapy is initiated with first-line drugs. When resistance develops, you can, you can uh, switch to second-line drugs. Uh, they tend to be more toxic and less effective, but, but at least they, they aren't resistant. The, the second-line drugs are. So if we look at how this is going to go down, the multi-drug treatment for tuberculosis, it normally begins with isoniazid and rifampin. And we're going to talk about what each of these drugs do. And then there are other drugs that are kind of included in these families, pyrazinamide, which is another selective anti-TB drug, uh, ethambutol, which is a bacterial bacteriostatic, so kind of an antibiotic that, that can work on it. Um, 
If treatment is successful, only two drugs may be continued and used, isozyanid and rifampin. And uh, the prototype drug that we're gonna that we're gonna look at next is uh, iso isoniazid. So for long-term therapy, it's usually six to twelve months, six to twelve months of drug therapy. So must reach all the isolated pathogens in the tubercles. That's the idea to uh, to cure this. Therapy must be continued even though, even if there are no symptoms. So you can kind of imagine that uh, compliance is going to be a problem. People might get tired of taking them, forget to take them a lot. So patients with multi-drug resistant infections may require therapy for 24 months. So if the the particular strain of mycobacterium TB that they have is resistant, then it may be, you know, with these second line drugs, it may take may take even longer. Okay, so let's look at the selective antibacterial. Our prototype, like we've been talking about, isoniazid, and it prevents the synthesis of that mycolic acid. So remember that waxy coating. It prevents the synthesis of those molecules that make that up. Therefore, it selectively inhibits the growth of mycobacteria because mycobacteria are the ones that have mycolic acid. That's why it's named that. So primary therapeutic use is active and latent tuberculosis. Active infections require multiple antibacterial medications. Uh, adverse effects, peripheral neuropathy, so it can cause some nerve damage. Uh, hepatotoxicity, so it's contraindicated in people with liver disease. Hyperglycemia and decreased glucose control, so that should get your attention for diabetes could have an effect. So it's a, it's a, uh, the drug does a lot of different stuff. Uh, isoniazid also inhibits MAO. Okay. And I don't know if you remember this, but monoamine oxidase, monoamine oxidase breaks down like monoamines, like serotonin, norepinephrine, norepinephrine uh, is a uh, yeah, nor serotonin, norepinephrine, and serotonin, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. So, and also tyramine. So tyramine was, was the big problem. And, and if we remember that, things like aged cheese, fish, that's what we were talking about tyramine. So we have the same issue, or we can have the same issue with isoniazid because it, because it also inhibits that monoamine oxidase. So other notes, uh, food interferes with absorption, so it should be given on an empty stomach. Multidrug therapy is what is related to this hyperglycemia. And isoniazid overdose may be fatal and should be treated with vitamin B6. And that's going to uh, have an effect in the liver. Okay, so that's, that's where that fatality could, could kind of originate. So the other drug that we were taking with our MD, MDT, our multidrug therapy, was rifampin. Rifampin is bactericidal. Okay, so it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, mycobacteria specifically or that mycolic acid. Uh, it's, it's a uh, mRNA, it inhibits messenger RNA synthesis, so it prevents the, uh, the production of messenger RNA so, the, so it can't make proteins and stuff. Okay, so which, prevent, yeah, which prevents the formation of proteins. So primary therapeutic uses, broad spectrum antibiotic effective for gram positive and gram negative bacteria, so, uh, and also in this case mycobacteria, Give it in combination with at least one other selective anti-TB medication to help prevent antibiotic resistance. So it's going to help kill those bacteria, make them die faster, and not give them a chance. So adverse effects are interesting for this. Discoloration of body fluids. So orange urine, orange sweat, saliva, and tears. So this stuff is pigmented. And so it passes that pigment on to body fluid. So, so you can see that with, with this particular drug. So remember that. Hepatotoxicity, so jaundice, anorexia, fatigue, mild GI discomfort, and then the pseudomembranous colitis, that's usually associated with uh, C. diff. It's uh, inflammation, intestinal colon inflammation. Okay, so the next group, the protozoa. Protozoa always confuse me in biology class. Is it a bacteria? Is it not a bacteria? Well, it's not a bacteria. It's not a bacteria because it has a nucleus and it has organelles. And so if it has a nucleus and it has organelles, then it's not a bacteria. So it's called a protozoan. It's still single-celled. Um, the most common is malaria. We're actually not going to talk about Malaria, but yeah, malaria is caused by a protozoan called plasmodium, transmitted by mosquitoes, significant disease, 
Um, second most fatal infectious disease, tuberculosis is the first that we just talked about, and thrive in areas of poor sanitation. So uh, chloroquine is the preferred anti-malarial antiprotozoal. I'm just really shocked that uh, ATI didn't include it in this section. Maybe it's planning on including it somewhere else, but I think it's, uh, it's important uh, to, uh, to kind of remember that, that it's a, a protozoan. Chloroquine is the, uh, it's the drug. We're not going to test over it right now, but I don't know. It seems like that's something that should be in your ATI stuff. So non-malaria, that is what we're going to talk about. So it's still protozoan, but it doesn't, it's protozoa that do not cause uh, malaria. So they thrive in unsanitary conditions, other protozoal diseases, amoebiasis, toxoplasmosis, giardias, uh, giardiasis, uh, cryptosporidium, trichomoniasis, and tri trypanosomiasis. Okay, well, anyway, that's what they're all called. But these are all non-malarial. Uh, so treatment of non-plasmodium protozoan disease requires a different set of medications from those used for malaria, and that's the one that we're going to learn. Drugs used to treat bacterial and fungal infections are ineffective. And that makes sense. So if we pause on that and we say, oh, wait, we can't use drugs to treat bacteria? No, because it's technically not a bacteria. However, it, it's technically not a fungus either, but it's a protozoan. So metro, uh, metronidazole. Metronidazole is uh, actually a, uh, it actually does work on bacteria, but it also works on protozoa. So it, so it dis disrupts DNA and protozoa and certain types of anaerobic bacteria. So primary therapeutic uses, treatment of protozoal infections like intestinal amoebiasis, some of the stuff that I just talked about that I don't really want to read again. Uh, treatment of anaerobic bacterial infections, anaerobic anaerobic and it is it is specific to anaerobic bacterial infections uh, C. diff that should that should raise some alarms so metronidazole can be used to treat uh, C. diff um, prophylaxis, prophylaxis for certain surgical procedures is also used treatment of H. pylori H. pylori is uh, is associated with uh, GI ulcers so uh, in combination with tetracycline, which we also looked at. So we can kind of see metronidazole, yes, it's treating these protozoal infections, but it also can have some other things that we're kind of familiar with, clostridium, H. pylori. So it can also be used to treat those. So adverse effects, GI discomfort, darkening of urine. We're not turning our sweat yellow or orange, but uh, darkening of urine can occur. Neurotoxicity, CNS effects, pseudomembranous colitis, which we see a lot with antibiotics and antiprotozoals. So fungi. So the next one we're going to talk about are fungi. Um, fun, fungi. Fungi. Fungi are single-celled, or they can be multicellular organisms, unlike protozoa. They're more complex than bacteria. They include mushrooms, yes, the ones that grow in your yard, yeasts, and molds. Okay, so those are all considered fungi. The ones that infect People aren't, we don't have mushrooms growing on us, but they're still in that, in that category. So out in the wild, so mushrooms can decompose dead organisms, but, but these, these fungi can grow in the, in the soil. So humans are exposed by handling contaminated soil or inhaling spores. Many systemic fungal infections begin in the lungs, okay, because they are inhaled. Um, like fungal, like pneumonia can happen, but only if you're really immunocompromised. So cell structure is more like humans than bacteria, so most antibacterial agents are ineffective. And so, yeah, that's what I was just saying. Um, fungal infections in humans are, are, are pretty rare. It's only, it's only in immunocompromised people that a, that a fungal infection in a human can, can happen, like in the lungs. Now, now getting it on your skin, which we see here, um, this person named Anna had a, had, oh, this shouldn't say athlete's foot, this should say um, ringworm. Okay, so that should be crossed out. But anyway, Anna, who is my daughter, uh, had this huge ringworm, uh, tinea corporis. And that's a type of, that's a type of fungus. It's a type of tinea. Um, so that's superficial. Superficial can affect scalp, skin, nails, mucous membranes, treated with topical agents. So a topical agent was used on that. Deeper infections may require oral uh, antifungal. And she also took an oral because this was really, really severe. Uh, thrush candidiasis. So this is what we see on the tongue. We have normal bacteria in the mouth. So yeast infections. Um, that's, that's 
the yeast is considered in that fungal family. So this is a uh, so yeast infections thrush, which is which is a type of yeast, uh, which is a type of fungus. So systemic affect internal organs, typically lungs, brain, meningitis can happen. Digestive organs, those are less common, can be fatal in immunosuppressed patients treated with oral or parenteral agents. So fungi affected unaffected by most antibiotics. So patients at risk for mycoses, that's what we're talking about when we talk about fungus. So fungal infections are mycoses. So patients at risk for mycoses, um, uh, so like I've been saying, it's uh, most, most serious fungal infections occur in patients with suppressed immune systems. So people with HIV, certain cancer treatments, so certain cancer treatments can lower your neutrophil levels, they can lower your white blood cell levels to the point that you can become, you can be more uh, affected by, by fungus. So community acquired infections can affect those with intact immune systems. Opportunistic infections are healthcare associated infections that occur in immunosuppressed patients. Okay, so depending on whether you get it from the hospital, it would be more opportunistic. Um, and then community acquired is, uh, is just out in the community. So goals of antifungal theory, therapy to rid the body of the fungal infection while causing as few adverse effects as possible. So you want to get rid of that without, without killing your own cells. So for superficial infections, topical solutions make sense. So for systemic, then you're going to have to use oral. Now, we're going to quickly, I want to look at this. I kind of want to pause on this. I know I've been kind of going through this pretty quickly. But I want to pause on this because if you if you remember how human cell walls are, or you know other other organisms, we have between our phospholipids that's where our cholesterol is. So we have cholesterol between them, and it kind of gives some rigidity to our to our cell membranes. Okay, I don't know if you remember that, but that's the way it is. We have we have cholesterol that kind of collects between between some of these. In a fungus, it's something called ergosterol. And we care about that because the drugs that we use, that's what they target. The antifungal drugs target that ergosterol. So drugs interfere with the process, and that's a specific process to fungi. Um, ergosterol is like our cholesterol, makes, us, makes up part of the cell membrane. Nystatin, amphotericin B bind to that. So they bind to that ergosterol that sits in the membrane and they block it, okay? So they, they kind of inactivate it, and that's gonna cause the cells to leak. And if the cells leak, the cells pop and they, and they, and they die. Ketoconazole blocks ergosterol from being made at all, and so all of the azoles, fluconazole, etriconazole, myconazole, all of these will block that ergosterol from even being made. So that's what it's doing. It's going to ultimately it's going to damage and affect that cell membrane and it's going to cause it to leak. So let's just go through that really quickly. So antifungals amphotericin B for systemic mycoses, systemic, okay, so it's going to be oral, uh, ketoconazole for treating both superficial and systemic. Mechanism of action, amphotericin B directly destroys the cell fungal cell membrane by binding that ergosterol. Ketoconazole blocks the production of ergosterol and therefore destroys the cell membrane. So primary therapeutic uses systemic fungal infections like candidiasis, which is a yeast infection, uh, superficial fungal infections like tinea infections, ringworm, athlete's foot, uh, jock itch or the groin, uh, candida infections of the skin. So adverse effects, infusion reactions, so that's putting it in and uh, thrombophlebitis, which is kind of associated with that. Electrolyte imbalances can occur, bone marrow suppression can occur, and uh, ketoconazole is hepatotoxic and may have an effect on sex hormones, which is kind of interesting. So in the males, it can cause gynomastia, decreased libido, erectile dysfunction. In females, irregular menstrual flow can occur. Okay, and that is the last of these drugs as I look for the stop sign.